Good morning. Good morning oh, look at that. I hope you all feel good this morning. So thanks very much for joining us. This talk is about software architecture pitched at software developers. There are two questions I want you to keep in your mind while you're listening to this talk. Imagine you're at work, you're doing some design, you're doing some architecture. These are the two key questions you really want to be asking about the thing you've drawn on the whiteboard. Do these pictures reflect what we think we're actually going to build? And it, does this design have a chance of working? For me, when I'm doing upfront design, that's essentially what I'm looking for. So this session is five things every developer should know about software architecture. Uh, we're going to go through these one by one. The first of these is the big one. Software architecture is not about big design up front. This is probably the biggest myth I've seen uh, over the past couple of decades. Historically, yes, there has been a tendency towards big upfront design. We all know where this has come from, right? The waterfall thing. The papers from the 70s, the heavyweight methods of the 80s and 90s do all these things in order. What's interesting is this image from the, the paper by Winston Royce. Further down the paper, he actually says this, I believe in this concept, but it doesn't actually work. And if he kept reading a little bit further, he actually talks about things like iterative and agile development, as we know them today, of course. So this whole thing happened in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. So I graduated in 96, so I missed the kind of uh, 70s and 80s from a software development perspective. But even during my career in the mid to late 1990s, you could see that organizations were looking to move away from big, heavyweight waterfall approaches to something a bit more lightweight. And of course, this ends up with the Agile Manifesto in 2001. And the Agile Manifesto says this, We've, we value responding to change over following a plan. And of course, on the face of it, this seems to turn everything on its head. And this is great. And I agree with this because big upfront design takes a long time. Feedback loops are horrendously long. But by the time you've delivered something, people have changed their minds. So that's all good. That's what this is aimed at, of course. But the, the practicality of this, the real world implication of all of this, is that many organizations, many teams, jumped from one extreme to the opposite extreme. And they literally went from big design upfront to nothing, which is kind of awkward. And there's a great quote I like to use here by a friend of mine. And he says this, big design up front is dumb, agreed, but doing no design up front is even dumber. And this is exactly what I've seen over the past 20 years. And people say, oh no, this is a straw man, you're joking, teams don't do this. They do. I've literally had teams tell me to my face, we don't do design because we do extreme programming instead. I'm like, what? That makes no sense. How is this working out for you? And they said, bad, that's why you're here. <laughs> right. We just start coding and we get into lots of technical debt very quickly. Yes, maybe you should start slowing down the thinking just a little bit more than you perhaps were. So, of course, the question here is how much upfront design should you be doing as a team? The waterfall approaches kind of say do all of it. The agile approaches, the iterative approaches on the surface of it say do nothing, but that's not actually what they say, of course. Sometimes you know what you're building, and sometimes you don't. So if you are a, if you're working in a big enterprise, you're doing like a system replacement project, a technology refresh project. You're building a, a system to meet some new compliance or regulations like GDPR. Those requirements are much more well known. You're much more confident in what you're designing. If you are building a product company, you're a startup. You've got some seed funding. You want to throw ideas out there, get feedback, pivot. That's a very, very different approach. So the summary here is you need to do just enough upfront design depending on your context. Now, you can tell I'm a consultant, right? <laughs> this is like a, a brilliant piece of advice and completely terrible at the same time because it's not quantifiable. There are a bunch of cartoons out there that you've probably seen over the past 10, 20 years. There's one with the uh, skateboard that turns into a car magically through a bunch of steps. Uh, Henrik Nieberg, and there's this version here which I like a little bit more. It's, it's from a blog post by Josh Kiriewski. It's called Ev Evolutionary Design, beginning with a primitive hole. And it's the same thing. You want to build a great sounding guitar, but you do it in iterations. Version one sounds horrible. 
but it gives you the ability to get some feedback and add features and make things better. And you can increment and progress and add features. At the end of your two-year journey, you've got a beautiful sounding guitar. And it's really easy to look back over the two-year journey and see the intermediate steps, see the building blocks and foundations you've laid. If you're at day one of this product, you have no idea where you are heading. And the thing we don't talk about enough, from my perspective, is how do you put a decent version one in place, a decent starting point, a decent minimum viable product that gives you a good set of foundations that you can build upon without accumulating tons and tons of technical debt. This is a talk about architecture. So what are we trying to do here? We're trying to put some architecture in place. What is architecture? There's a great quote by Grady Boots that I love. And I, I really love this as a way to think about what is architectural in nature. He says that architecture represents the significant decisions where significance is measured by cost of change. This is a great way to think about what is architectural and what is not. It's the things that are hard to change. Choice of language. If you start building an app in Java, once you have 10,000 lines of Java code, you have Java. That's hard to change later. If you're going down the microservices route, you have a bunch of distributed services on your network. That's hard to collapse back into a monolith. The same is true the other way, of course. The frameworks, the technologies, the APIs that become embedded into your code base, the data models, the data structures, all of this stuff becomes hard to change at some point. So for me, that's really what I want to focus on. I want to focus on the tech choices, the modularity choices, the decomposition choices, the frameworks and the, and the technologies that become baked into the thing that we're building. Stuff like tabs versus white spaces, I don't care. Right, we can have all those religious battles, but at the end of the day, we can just make a checks our rule and fix it one way or the other. We're not trying to decide everything. If I think about some of the projects I worked on in the late 90s, early 2000s, when I was a developer and I had people managing me, before writing a feature, before adding a feature, I was asked to write a document that detailed all the classes I wanted to build, all the classes I wanted to change, a class diagram of all that stuff, a bunch of test cases I was expecting to run, and then I would have to get that reviewed. If I was adding data to a, a data model, Please give us a list of all the fields, the columns, the column lengths, the data types that you want to add to the data model. Right? We don't do that anymore. There's no need to do that anymore in most cases. So we're not trying to decide everything. So this begs the question, what are we trying to decide? Martin Fowler said this a long time ago on his blog, Is Design Dead? He said this, I think there is a role for broad starting point architecture. Such things as stating early on how to layer the application so how are we going to do modularity and decomposition? What's the structure we're going to have in our code base? How you'll interact with the database if you need one, so anything around data structures, data writing, reading, querying, et cetera, and how we're going to handle web requests. Again, these are architectural decisions. Once these things become baked into your code base, they're kind of hard to change later. And what we're trying to do here, ultimately, is we're trying to create a starting point. It's like that version one of the guitar. We create a starting point, we put some things in place that we know are not going to change, and then we can have firm foundation to build on in the future. That enables us to start answering these questions in a little bit more detail. So now we can sketch out some diagrams, we can make some decisions, and of course, ADRs are a great way to record decisions. And we can start answering questions, yeah, do I think the diagrams reflect what we think we're going to build? And how confident are we that this thing, this design is going to work? That second question is a little bit trickier to answer, though, of course. You can have a bunch of wonderful diagrams, but the second question is a bit trickier to answer. So I'm going to fall back on Scott Ambler. He has a bunch of great work on agility and architecture as well. And he has a great essay on agile architecture, and you can summarize it in one sentence. Base your architecture on your requirements. So go find the things that drive your architecture decisions. In a nutshell, requirements at a high level, ecology attributes at a high level, constraint of your environment or your government or regulations, whatever it is, and the principles, the architecture principles that you want to adopt as a team. Figure that stuff out. Do just enough. Be efficient. Be lightweight. Travel light. So that's the whole agility thing here. And prove your architecture with concrete experiments. A concrete experiment is nothing more than everything we think it is. It's writing some code to prove a hypothesis. 
We have a bunch of names for these things. Traces, spikes, XUs for reference architectures, walking skeletons, you name it, we've probably called it something else. It's basically writing some code to prove a hypothesis. And what we're ultimately trying to do here is we're trying to identify and mitigate our highest priority risks. I see a lot of people struggling with this concept in modern software development. They're like, Simon, how can we deal with risks better? And my answer is, go and read the Rational Unified Process book. Who knows RUP, Rational Unified Process? Spot the old people, yes. <laughs> RUP is a risk-driven approach to building software. And it's old, and it's big, and it's a huge bloated process framework, but you can trim it down, but nobody did that. But it has risk at its heart. And it's really powerful. It shifts the risky stuff to the, uh, the early phases of the project lifecycle. How do you identify risks? There's a technique you can find online I created called risk storming. It's a really nice visual collaborative approach to uh, risk identification. A bit like planning poker for risks. So it removes some of the subjectivity associated with risk identification. And things like threat modeling are becoming more and more popular. Uh, probably the threat modeling approach I see the most is Stride, which I believe came from Microsoft quite a while ago now. But yeah, I, I see lots of people doing threat modeling, uh, particularly because GDPR and security concerns about using cloud providers, et cetera, et cetera. So how much upfront design should we do? I'm not going to answer this question because it's a really stupid question to ask. Because you'll get answers like none, or lots, or a number of days, and people are wanting a number of days. So I'm going to do this instead. Let's assume we are going to do some upfront design. Let's assume we want to put a starting point in place. Let's flip the question on its head. When do you stop doing upfront design? Upfront design is an iterative and incremental process. Process might be the wrong word there, but it's an incremental and uh, iterative activity, let's say. So you're never going to get your design right first time around. You're going to have to iterate a bunch of times. That's absolutely fine. So when do you stop iterating? Basically, it's a set of goals. This is how I treat this. Number one, do you understand the things that are driving your architecture decisions? Do you understand your requirements, your quality attributes, your constraints, your principles? If so, you're done. Move on. Do you have a good understanding of the context and scope of the thing you are designing and building? In other words, can you draw a C4 context diagram, we'll talk about that later, that basically says this is the thing we're building, this is the world around it. If you can, you're good. Do you understand the significant design decisions you are making as a team, mostly around technology and modularity? In the real world, can you draw a C4 container diagram? I'll talk about that later as well. Do you have a way to communicate your vision with other people, diagrams? Are you confident that your design satisfies the key architectural drivers? Have you done architectural dry runs? Do you think it's going to work? And finally, have you identified the risks and are you confident that your solution is going to work? Have you done proof of concept where necessary? If I can do this set of things, I'm happy I can now move on to you know, cranking out the code at a high pace. How do we do those things? That's our toolbox. There's a ton of stuff out there in the industry. Some of these are new things like event storming and impact mapping. And you'll notice there are some older, more classical techniques on this list as well. CRC, ATAM, TARA, some of the architecture evaluation techniques. This is our toolbox. There's a bunch of stuff out there. We just have to go discover it. So for me, upfront design is not about creating a perfect end state, a perfect set of blueprints. It's about creating a good enough starting point and setting a direction that the team are going to move in. That direction likely will change once we start getting feedback. As I said before, we're not going to get everything right first time around. We are going to have to backtrack, pivot, fix, clean up some technical debt. But hopefully, let's set a general decent starting point and a direction. So this is my recommended advocated approach. It's some degree of upfront design but admitting that we're not going to get everything right, and we are going to have to do some evolutionary design as we learn, as we get feedback, as the world changes. So that's point one. Software architecture is not about big upfront design. It's about putting a starting point in place and setting a direction. Number two, this is closely related, of course. Uh, it, essentially, this is about technical leadership. And every team needs technical leadership. One of the things I've heard a ton of teams over the past few years say is this. 
Software teams don't need architects. This is normally said as a reaction to those horrible ivory tower architects that you might have seen 10 or 20 years ago. And teams don't want these types of characters on their project teams, so we don't need architects. I agree with these words. I don't agree with why they've been said. Why do I agree with these words? You don't need someone on the team with, who has a badge that labeled architect, but you do need technical leadership. And every team needs technical leadership. I think that's the more important takeaway here. And in many teams, there is no one called an architect. But of course, collaboratively, collectively, those individuals are providing some degree of technical leadership. What happens if you don't have this? Chaos. Messy code bases, spaghetti code systems, who's working on these? No, please don't answer. Uh, inconsistent approaches to solving the same problems, ignoring quality attributes like performance and scaling. This is what happens if we don't have a sufficient quantity of technical leadership on our teams. So this is why I talk about the software architecture role. And for me, the software architecture role is about injecting technical leadership into our software development teams. And it comprises of a bunch of responsibilities, a bunch of activities. It's about proactively seeking out and managing and challenging the architectural drivers, the requirements, the quality attributes, the constraints, the principles. It's about designing the software. This is where the fun, creative stuff sits. It's about looking after and managing technical risks to point back to the stuff I just talked about before. It's all about technical leadership. It's about proactively adding continuous technical leadership, making sure people are not drifting off course. And there's something in here about quality assurance. This is not necessarily doing code reviews and peer reviews and reviewing or pull requests. But if you're setting out a set of architectural principles and you say, right, our code is going to be structured using a package by feature approach, let's make sure everybody is following that package by feature approach whether that's by you installing a check style rule to make sure people are doing it, an arc unit, or whether you're doing it manually is a different question, of course. And this is applicable to all teams. So all teams need technical leadership. If I'm a one-person team at home in my, in my shed building a startup, I need technical leadership. If you are all one team working co-located, distributed all around the world, you also need technical leadership but we need it in different quantities. I need a little bit, you need quite a lot. Number three, to, to, to talk about the role a bit more, uh, the software architecture role is about coding, coaching, and collaboration. So again, I want to shift away from this kind of ivory tower approach we might have seen 10 or 20 years ago. I used to work in London. And I used to be part of the small team of people in the company I worked for. It's a small consulting company. And we used to interview developers and architects to come and join us, which was quite cool. And I did this interview one day, and this guy came through a door and said, hey, nice to meet you. Take a seat. Describe your position in your company and what you do now. Describe your role. And he said, hi, I'm a solution architect for one of the top four consulting firms. I said, hi, nice to meet you. What do you do? And he said, well, I go to customers. I get the requirements, I do some analysis, we have some workshops, we do some discussion. I then go back to my office and I draft up a software architecture document. Right, and what next? And I give it to, uh, to a team of our in-house developers and they build it for me. And he stopped talking. I'm like, so what next? You go on vacation? No, I go and do the same thing again. I go to a different customer, and I repeat the whole process. And I said, hang on a second. Does this mean you are not involved in building the thing you have just designed? And he said, yes. That is correct. I am not involved. I said, why not? And he said, because I'm a solution architect. <laughs> I said, OK, so what happens if the team of developers don't understand something, and they need input and advice and clarification? And he said, I'm quite busy because I'm doing work for other clients, they'll have to email me, and I'll get back to them at some point. Right. So you have no involvement at all in the thing you have designed. And he said, no, that's an implementation detail, not my job. What an ass. We were looking for like hands-on software architects, so he did not get a job. 
I call this thing ass. It's architecture as a service. <laughs> It's just a, a one-way stream of architect decisions to a, an unsuspecting team who have no input in those decisions. This is also called, by the way, the seagull approach to consulting. A, a company comes in, they crap all over your team, and then they fly off, and you have to clean up the mess. This is exactly the same approach. The thing that's missing here is the feedback loop. The people designing software need to be building the software. Otherwise, you never get to see your own mistakes and, and learn from them, etc. If that's not possible, you grab the developers and you get them involved in that early stage work. So that feedback loop has to be closed somehow. So from my perspective, this is not just the ass architect for four weeks. This is a continuous approach to technical leadership. This is making sure we're always consciously making justified architecture decisions until the software stops being worked on. Anyone who uh, went to Kevin's talk yesterday evening, that might be never. We call it maintenance, but that's still software development. He's right. How much leadership do we need? This is the key question. And it turns out every team is different. And I don't think we acknowledge this as much as we should. There's a great book on this topic. It's not, this book is not about software architecture. It's not about technical leadership but it's about team leadership on technical teams. It's called Elastic Leadership by Roy Osherove. And it, the concept is this. Imagine you have a scale, a spectrum of team maturity. On the one side, you have your very chaotic teams. These people are, are always running around with their heads on fire. They're always breaking stuff. They don't work well as a team unit. They're just bad. On the other side, you have your team of Rockstar, Ninja, 10Xs, or insert other stupid, dumb terms here, but basically good people who know what they're doing. The chaotic people, if you leave them to their own devices and trust them to do the right thing, they're going to fail. They've proven this by running around with their heads on fire all the time. The leadership approach you take with these people is command and control. Hey, you have a problem. You clearly don't know how to solve it. This is the solution. Go do these steps. If you apply that same leadership approach over here, that's going to backfire very, very quickly. Because these people know what they're doing. They don't need to be told. They don't like being told. It's demotivating for them. So this is a very much hands off, remove blockers, trust them. They're good. They know what's going on. Even with these folks down here, you still need to give them a little bit of rope to hang themselves so they can learn from their mistakes and therefore become more mature but it's a very different leadership style. And what you might find is you've got both styles of people on the same team. And you use that to your advantage. You either mix it up and make people over here the command and control leaders, or you keep them segregated and you apply different leadership styles as appropriate. So I think it's a really interesting approach to take around leadership. Different, different teams need different styles of leadership. Something I always used to do was pair architecting. This is a really simple but powerful approach to doing design and architecture. Why? Two heads better than one. We get to bounce ideas off each other. This is just a nice way to do collaborative modern software design. It also reduces the bus factor. If one of us gets run over by a bus or leaves, we still have some continuity of ideas and knowledge. Soft skills are a huge part of people doing the technical leadership role, the software architecture role. There's nothing on this slide that's unique to software development. But for me, this is what separates developers from people in tech lead in architecture roles. You need to be able to present your ideas, communicate your ideas, you need to motivate people, you need to influence people. Influencing is a big part of this, right? Because we want everybody on the team to go in the same direction. And that's not always the case. People have got problems at home. They've got different ideas, different experiences. We need to rally up all these people and get them going in the same direction. This could be overt persuasion techniques. It could be neuro-linguistic programming. It could be Jedi mind tricks. No, this isn't the architecture we're looking for. Move along. Right? There's a whole bunch of ways we can influence people, and that's part of the leadership role. It's about motivating people. It's about facilitating discussions, reaching consensus, and dealing with all the nasty politics that sits around most organizations. In terms of coding, I'm a big fan, I'm a big proponent of architects writing code because it 
keeps us grounded. It allows us to learn about new tech, keep our skills up to date, to see what's actually going to work and what's not going to work. My preference in doing this is that architects write production code. So that, uh, that ass architect needed to be writing production code for, for, for me to basically give him a job. Sometimes that's not possible. Sometimes it's smaller bits of work, like proof of concepts and prototypes and concrete experiments and building frameworks and things, experimentation. But ultimately, I think people in a tech lead role need to have some connection with the code to keep their skills up to date, to keep them grounded, essentially. And it should be no surprise that most good architects are also good developers. They've grown into that role. They've learned from their mistakes. They've seen the wider world. It's very hard to just put someone in a tech lead role with no software development experience. I saw something on Reddit last week. Um, good architects are made, not born. It's an experience-based role, essentially. You don't need to be the best coder on the team, but you need to be a decent coder, I think. Because if you don't, you don't potentially understand the trade-offs that you're making when you're choosing technology. So say you have two frameworks, A and B. If you don't know anything about technology, you'll just choose one because it looks fancy. If you know about technology, you can start asking the right questions. You can start figuring out, is this going to work based on what we need to use it for? And that allows you to, again, start answering these questions in a bit more detail with a bit more confidence. So the software architecture role is multifaceted. It requires a bunch of deep technical skills. Most of the architects I know have a specialism in something like Java or .NET or Oracle or mobile or data warehousing or something. There's normally a specialism that sits behind their skills. This is what they've kind of uh, rose through the ranks with. But they also have some technical breadth. They understand about design patterns and architectural styles, distributed versus not distributed, synchronous versus asynchronous, uh, acid versus eventual consistency. They know about some of those kind of broader topics with the soft skills all layered on top. Interesting side here. I said that most architects have a specialism in something like Java or .NET or Oracle. Most products are never one tech stack. It's normally a JavaScript front end talking to a, a Spring Boot back end talking to a, an Oracle database. So now maybe we find three people with three specialisms, one in the front end JavaScript thing you're using, which will change next week, of course, something in Spring Boot, Java, and Oracle. And you have these three individuals collectively undertake the software architecture role, the technical leadership role, and you utilize their specialisms and their experiences. My favorite one, for those of you who know me, this is my favorite one. You don't need to use UML. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's a bit early advanced, but thank you. I regularly ask people uh, how many people use UML. We could try it here, but I can't see, and it's quite a big, wide audience. So when I ask this people, it's typically one out of 10 will raise their hand to say, yeah, we're using UML. When you drill into it, it's normally, oh, we only use class diagrams and sequence diagrams, by the way. So even the UML usage of the people who use UML is, is also quite low. There are some exceptions to this. If you go to uh, countries like Germany, you might get two out of 10. This is a good, I, I don't know why you're laughing. This is a good thing. They're doing something better than the rest of Europe. And also, the Netherlands, the, the, the Netherlands is really interesting. If you go to Amsterdam, you'll get this. You'll get one out of 10. But if you jump on a train and go to Eindhoven, you might get two out of 10. And it's very regional. And Eindhoven has a bunch of uh, tech companies who do like hardware, firmware, software. Uh, so Philips, ASML, they're, they're building uh, kind of hardware, firmware things. And um, because that's a bit more structured, I think there's a, a, a bit more formality in maybe the software development that's happening there. But actually, in many organizations, it's zero. <laughs> Spe specifically, younger teams, it's zero. And this is a generational thing, and it's not going to get any better. So because we don't use UML, the universities and the colleges have realized this, and they no longer teach UML to their students as much as they used to. I did a guest lecture at a university in the Netherlands end of last year, and we had a meeting afterwards, and they say, hey, we need to teach UML as a part of our three-year curriculum. We have one week. What would you recommend we teach? I'm like, oh my goodness, one week to teach all of UML. 
in a three-year course. So the students are now not being exposed to UML as much as they were in their courses. They're graduating, they're, they're joining teams, the teams are not using UML, so they don't get exposure that way either. Five years goes past, now they are leading teams, they've moved into tech lead and software architecture roles, and hey, they need to draw some pictures. Well, they've never seen UML before, so UML is not going to even enter their mind. They're just going to draw a bunch of boxes and arrows diagrams. So there's no way this is going to get any higher unless something dramatic happens with UML. Why don't people want to use UML? I've literally heard every single possible excuse you can imagine these things have said to my face. Some of them by Swedish companies, I know who you are. <laughs> In Stockholm. Uh, lack of knowledge is a big one here. Uh, you'll be seen as old and old-fashioned was very funny. I'm like, really? That's honestly what you think in this organization. The tooling sucks. UML tooling has been interesting. Rash rows. That kind of like funny yellow beigey interior with the pink purple exterior, the borders. Like someone thought that looked pretty, but it doesn't. Uh, the tooling has typically been very expensive and horrible to use. It's too detailed. It's not. UML is a language. The specification is 800 pages. I grant you that. But you don't need to use all of the language in order to draw some diagrams. Martin Fowler has a UML as a sketch thing on his website. He had a great book out in 1999, UML 1.1 distilled. So you don't need to use the whole language. But there is something about UML that drags you into the detail. You want to draw a class diagram, and you want to model a link between those two classes. Do you use the black diamond or the white diamond? Wait, there are diamonds? <laughs> OK, what's the difference between the diamonds? It's aggregation or composition. I forget which way around. What does that mean? Let's go to Wikipedia, aggregation versus composition. You have a car. The car has four wheels. If you destroy the car, do the wheels get destroyed? Well, did you take them off the car first? <laughs> I don't know. All I want to do is draw a line between two classes, and now I'm stuck down some rabbit hole. <laughs> there is something about UML that drags you into that level of detail, and sometimes it's unnecessary. And of course, lots of people tell me that UML is not a part of Agile, which is absolute nonsense. When the whole Agile thing came in, teams threw away big design up front, which is a good thing. However, in many of those same teams, UML became coupled as a big upfront design technique and approach. And therefore, when big design upfront was thrown away, UML was also thrown away with it. So it's one of those baby and bathwater moments, which is kind of unfortunate. I'm sure some of you will know this guy. He had a YouTube channel for a while. I don't think he's running anymore. Uh, he had a, a, an episode that talks about UML, and this was his conclusion. It's a very elaborate waste of time. You should definitely find a video on YouTube. It's very funny. But it kind of begs the question of what's the answer here? And his answer in his video was this, just use a whiteboard. Now, I've been running software architecture workshops around the world for about 15 years. And this is what we get people to do. We get people to do some design and draw some pictures on a whiteboard. So I've seen, I've seen firsthand what happens when you ask people to just use a whiteboard. Boxes and no lines. Utterly horrible diagram. Yeah. That's... That's like London Heathrow or Frankfurt Airport. From there you can get to tons of other places around the world. I don't know what that is. This one's super generic. You could basically take a photo of this and say, I've, I've drawn your architecture diagram. This is just super generic. It doesn't even tell you anything about the business domain. It just tells you there's a business logic thing in the middle. Wow. This one has no tech choices on. I just did that whole spiel about architectural decisions and technology choices. This is lacking all that stuff. This looks like a bunch of C-sharp microservices kind of floating around a database, but I think this is a C-sharp monolith with some boxes and containment missing. This one's also horrendous. <laughs> it's like one of those adventure games, choose different paths. You always die. 
end up in the trap. <laughs> All arrows lead to the trap. Stormtroopers, faceless anonymous clones attacking this poor reporting service. Utter mess. I, I have. I used to take photos of the diagrams from my training courses. I got to about six gigabytes and just gave up because I, I just didn't do anything with them. They're sitting on a folder at home somewhere. Um, this isn't a tooling issue. People used to ask me, if you let people use some tooling, do you get better pictures? No. COVID happened, and I was running these workshops online, and we were using Miro and Mural, and we got exactly the same diagrams in a tool. So the tools make your diagrams look nicer, but they don't necessarily fix the underlying problems, which is an issue because now you can't answer those questions. Here's a bunch of random boxes with a million lines. Does this weird diagram reflect what we think we're going to build? I have no idea because I don't understand it. If you can't see the solution, you can't evaluate it, you can't review it, you can't do anything with it. The value is in the conversation. That only works if you're able to actually have the same conversation around the same diagram. And if it's ambiguous, you just can't do that. We need ubiquitous language. What's really funny, of course, is over the past like 10 years, we've been talking about domain-driven design a lot, creating a ubiquitous language that we can use as technologists to talk to non-technologists. This is what our customer means within this bounded context. We have completely forgotten to create a big language that we can use to discuss the internals of our software system. So with that in mind, back in 2000 and, I don't know, six, seven, eight, I'm not entirely sure, I created something called the C4 model for visualizing software architecture. And it was, it was, it was created as a way to basically get people to draw better diagrams because I was running these software architecture workshops and I could not understand anybody else's diagrams. And I thought, this is an issue, this has to stop. So the C4 model for visualizing software architecture is essentially a set of hierarchical abstractions that you can then draw a set of hierarchical diagrams on top of. So it's four levels of diagrams, context, containers, components, and code. And the concept here is diagrams as maps. So I live in Jersey in the Channel Islands. Who's heard of Bergerac? Let's try this in Sweden. Yeah. This is Bergerac. How long have we got? Seven minutes. I'll do the short version. Bergerac was a 1980s detective show uh, filmed on the island of Jersey. And for some reason, it was exported to Norway and Sweden. And I have no idea why, but that's why you know Bergerac. And he used to drive around this really cool looking old car. Um, it was, it, like Watching it now, it's terrible, but it was really good at the time. So I live in Jersey in Channel Islands. If you do a search for Jersey on Google Maps, you'll get that picture. So Google Maps goes, oh, you want to know where Jersey is? I'll make it as big as I possibly can. This is great if you want to know where the airport is in conjunction to like the main town, where the nice beaches are. If you've never heard of Jersey because you're too young to know what Bergerac is, you have no idea what's going on here. How do you fix this problem with Google Maps? You pinch to zoom out. Eventually, if you pinch far enough, Jersey disappears because it's only 15 kilometers by 10. There are a lot of murders in this tiny island. <laughs> I'm alive. I survived. Um, on the flip side, you can zoom in and zoom in and zoom in, and eventually you drop into Google Street View. Google Street View is a one-to-one -one mapping with the real world when the photos were taken. And I wanted to do the same thing with software architecture diagrams. I want a high-level diagram saying, this is the thing we're building. These are the people using it. So this is the system integrations around it. So this is the context of what we're building. These are the features that sit inside our system boundary. These are the ones that sit outside our system boundary. And then I want to progressively zoom in and zoom in and zoom in to get more details. Although C4 has four in the name, you don't need to use all four levels. The four levels are there for completeness. So it's different levels of diagrams that give you different zoom levels that allow you to show different levels of abstraction and therefore let you tell different stories to different audiences. That's the key thing here. That's the summary of C4 model. If you go to c4model.com, uh, this is essentially the summary. It's a set of four hierarchical abstractions, a set of matching diagram types. C4 is notation independent. So you can use boxes and arrows as long as you have a diagram key. Or you could use UML or Archimate as your notation. That's absolutely fine. And it's also tooling independent. So c4mod.com is where you can go to get more information uh, about all of this stuff. If you want to learn this firsthand, I'm running a workshop as a part of the JFocus training camp on the 28th of May. I'm going to be 
I'm not sure which floor we're on now, but if you go to the main exhibition area and go up the stairs, you'll see the Google booth and then the JFocus booth. I'll be on the JFocus booth at 12.30 if you want to come and ask me questions about what the uh, workshop entails, but this is a big part of the workshop. If you don't want to do that, uh, you can go to YouTube and you can do a search for C for Models as Code if you're interested in the, in the tooling side of this. This is the question I always get asked. And there's a talk on there that tells you my approach to uh, using kind of diagrams as code type tools to create these C for Model diagrams, interactive, hierarchical, et cetera, et cetera. This talk is missing some new demos. Uh, I've put together a bunch of new demos recently that do things like integration with Spotify's Backstage. So lots of organizations using things like Backstage, our system catalogs. My tooling can kind of integrate with that and give you uh, nice diagrams off the back of it. All my tooling is all also open source, easy to find on GitHub. So number five, the final little thing. A good software architect enables agility. We always used to think that agility and architecture were competing forces, but they're not, they're complementary. And I think that's one of the biggest things I've learned over the past uh, decade or so. What does Agile mean? I have no idea. Agile's lost its way, lost its meaning, et cetera, et cetera. I think for many people, Agile is about this stuff, moving fast, embracing change, delivering quickly, getting feedback. This is really the process and mechanical side of being Agile and releasing often. And that's fine. That's a big part of this. But I think this is missing the point. I think for me, it's really about that mindset of continuous improvement. I think that's the essence, that's the heart of agility here. And of course, this applies to the way that we work, and also it applies to our code bases. We're taking our code base, we're adding a feature, we need to inspect what we have and adapt it. It's exactly the same thing. A good architecture lets you do this easier. This makes sense, like from a gut feel perspective, this makes sense. For those of you who are unfortunate to be working on those horrible big balls of mud style code bases, you make a change over here and a bunch of stuff breaks and you don't know why because it shouldn't be coupled, but it is, that slows you down. Your code base is brittle, it's fragile. On the flip side, if you have a code base that's well modularized, it's well decomposed, You've got nice hard boundaries around units in your code base. You can make a change inside that unit and it, you don't have that horrible blast effect, that ripple effect across the rest of your code base that allows you to move faster. So that's why I say this, a good architect enables agility. What do I mean by good architecture? It's very subjective, but for me, it's about structure. It's having a good, well-defined, well-thought-out, justified structure. And you don't get that for free. And this is where the thinking comes into play that we talked about right at the start of the session. George Fairbanks has a great book on architecture and he says this, a good architecture rarely happens through architect in different design. This is just th jumping on a solution because that's what we've always done. That's what the books tell us. That's what the conference talks tell us. Or hype, trend, and fashion. Which, of course, leads me to my friends, microservices. I've seen a ton of teams over the past decade jump on microservices because they think it's the best way to solve their horrible big ball of mud problem. They have a, a, a legacy system, again, see Kevin's talk, and it's just hard to work with, it's hard to change. So rather than putting the effort into making it cleaner and, and refactoring it, we're just gonna start from scratch and build a set of microservices for all of the good things around microservices. And of course, people miss, and they end up with the distributed version of the crap they had before. And they just stick JSON over HTTPS calls between seams in their monolith, and they think, yeah, we're done now. And then it's lockstep deployed, it's very fragile, it's very brittle, and it's also really, really slow. And they've kind of missed all the benefits of a microservices architecture and Conway's law, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why I talk about modular, modular monoliths. And thankfully, this is starting to come back into fashion now. There's a lot of stuff you can do with a well-structured monolith. It allows you to find your seams, refactor inside that code base, and pull these things out into individual services in the future if you want to. We always talk about extremes. How do we know what style of architecture to build? Use agility as a driver. Maybe have the majority of your features in a monolith 
with a bunch of services around the edge because they are more volatile, they change more quickly, and therefore they are better owned by separate teams. Insert commas or reference here. Final slide. Kevlin said you, should, it, you can't have a talk in 2024 without talking about AI. I don't talk about AI, which is awkward, so I'm going to use Architect Clippy instead. I see you have a poorly structured monolith. Would you like me to convert it to a poorly structured set of microservices? No. <laughs> Again, thinking is good. So that's my talk, five things every developer should know about software architecture. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>